Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. Tonight, we are very excited to continue the V Brown Bag IT Career Series. And tonight, I am excited to introduce to you Dennis Dyack. Uh, he is the creator of a lot of games that you know and love. And tonight, he's going to talk to us about getting into the video game industry. But before we do that, let's go through the show notes. Get in on the conversation. If you at the brown bag or hashtag the brown bag, myself, Ziggy, and Sean will be paying attention on the Twitters here and making sure that we field all of your questions uh, to Mr. Dyack. Um, and if you want to follow the other channels, you can also watch the Latin America, EMEA, and Brazil uh, V Brown Bag channels at the commensurate uh, Twitter handles that you see on the screen. Again, our guest tonight is Dennis Dyack. You can follow him at Dennis underscore Dyack on Twitter. I am your host, Chris Williams. You can follow me at Mistwire. Ms. Ziggy. I'm Signe Angler. You can follow me at Signe Angler on Twitter. And you know what's coming next, Sean. And I'm Sean Doyle. You can follow me at Cloud Osmotic on Twitter. And uh, a quick shout out to Sean and Ziggy. This is, these are their Ziggy's second time and Sean's first time as my co-host on V Brown Bag. Welcome them all to the channel. All right, so without further ado, um, there's there's a lot of stuff to unpack here. This is the guy that made Blood Omen and Le Blood Omen Legacy of Cain, Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem, Too Human, and he's currently creating something that uh, he's gonna talk about called Dead House Sonata. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you Mr. Dennis Dyack. I'm gonna stop the share and the power is yours, sir. Awesome, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. And hopefully this is working. Is, can you see this? All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, my name is Dennis Dyack, uh, here to talk about how to get into the video game industry. And um, generally, uh, you're going to find with me that my talks are uh, somewhat different in the sense that I, I think it's uh, incumbent upon me to cr create some provocative uh, thinking and throw out some ideas where uh, hopefully everyone will have some level of challenge um, and uh, leave with um, a sort of really different outlook before they came into the talk. So, and I think with the video game industry and the talk about how to get into the video game industry, uh, that is really important because quite frankly, uh, the video game industry is completely opaque. Uh, most people who talk about it and who aren't in it uh, are way off. It's very different than what most people think. So. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a perspective on that from someone who's been in the industry for 30 years. I've been doing video games for a very long time. And uh, I uh, believe it or not, I, I started out, my first degree was in physical education. So if we're going to start talking about education, uh, all my friends were wrestlers at the time. I'm uh, from the Niagara Falls area in Canada. And uh, Brock University, which is uh, the university here, uh, is absolutely the best university for wrestling in Canada, bar none. Uh, the many Oly Olympians come from here. And uh, I, when, I, when I graduated from high school, I had the choice of you know, going to the computer science or hanging out with my friends in wrestling. And I, uh, I chose to hang out with my friends and I got a phys ed degree. And then when I was uh, graduating from phys ed, I had choices of you know, joining the RCMP, which I was accepted into, uh, becoming uh, a pharmaceutical rep or maybe going to teacher's college to become a phys ed teacher. And I realized I wanted to make video games. So I put myself through for computer science. And then from there, I went on to do a master's degree in computer science, uh, which I did some neural network stuff and uh, some user interface stuff. Uh, and uh, really uh, glad I did that. And from there, uh, during uh, those second and third degrees, I uh, started uh, my first company and started making, you know, Legacy of Kane, Eternal Darkness, Metal Gear Solid. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with some really great people uh, over the years. And I think, um, I think that we are our history, which is um, really something that, that I, I think forms uh, in, in today's society. I, th I think really that more than anything else, um, you really want to define where you're going. And I was saying this earlier, I believe I'm a big believer. If you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And I've always followed my heart when it comes to these things. And, um, 
when I started working on a game called Dead House Sonata, where you play the undead fighting the living, it is an action RPG uh, that's free to play, narrative driven, uh, which a lot of people will say uh, free to play and narrative driven games are oxymorons. That's part of the challenge and why I'm excited about it. Um, but also, um, I just love it. I love making video games and uh, I, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. And more than uh, more than that, um, I think that I think that that's really important if you're going to pick a career choice that you do something you love. And in some sense, consider this a test or a Turing test. If you really love video games, hopefully this will be something you like. So my background is comp computer science, but in, in the video game industry, I'm known for telling stories. Um, and that, that is, has a long history. And I guess, I guess if I'm to talk about the history more than anything else, in my youngest days in the video game industry, I was very adamant that we needed an Aristotle's poetics for the games industry. And um, back then, I think there was a real emphasis, a rock star emphasis, not the company, but a mentality of I make games and my games are good and they're good because I'm cool at it. And there was no educational or theoretical background on why this game was good and why this game wasn't good. So I started asking questions, why are these games good and why are these games bad? And I found out that not too many people were actually asking them. And so when it comes to understanding video games, at least from my perspective and trying to get into the video game industry, you need to have an understanding of why you wanna get into the industry. Um, and I'm gonna talk about my way of making video games. And there are many ways, there's no one way, but think about this way as in the Book of Five Rings from Miyamoto Masashi, where uh, you need to learn all the weapons and all the skills to have a good understanding of your environment to not only to survive, but thrive. And um, so what you're gonna get here is sort of my perspective on thinking about, well, if there was a foundation uh, for creating video games like there is poetics for you know creating movies television and, and stories what would that be and i'm going to also talk about from there what are the paths that i see into the industry what are the good ones what are the bad ones and then finally where i think the future of the industry is growing so sort of think about it in that perspective um aristotle in my eyes uh certainly foundational uh, there are some great things about Aristotle. There's some very negative things. I often criticize Aristotle's way of script writing and the three act narrative, but those are, those are, those are discussions for another day. I absolutely admire the foundation of, you know, quite frankly, Western content that uh, he helped build. And um, so let's sort of start thinking about what I was talking about. Here's, here's a question. What makes a good video game? What is the most important thing in a video game? If you had to pick one thing, call it out, what is it? And let's start off by saying there's no formula for making video games. There's so many genres. There's, you know, there's action adventures, there's RPGs, there's sports games, there's racing games, there's fighting games, first person shooters, lots. There are many platforms. There's, you know, mobile games, there's PC games, there's console games. So what is the thing that defines a good game? And if you're thinking about getting into the industry, I think this is a very good question to ask. Now I mentioned this a little bit yesterday in a talk, but I think it's really more important here if I was to say one thing that I feel is important when I think about the games that I make is that I study the medium. Studying the medium is super important. Marshall McLuhan, uh, you're a big fan. And you know the medium is definitely the message. Now here's some things that a lot of people don't really necessarily recognize about Marshall McLuhan. If you look at the box, the book cover, uh, that was, uh, you know, his original book when it was published, it actually says the medium is the massage. And it was a misprint. And the story goes that it was a typo 
so his son says, and when the book was published, he believed in what are we saying that the medium was the message was so powerful that that would overcome the typo when people would only see the medium is the message. And that's all that they would remember because that's the thesis of this book. Um, so he left it in rather than try to get a reprint. So it's always been the cover and title of the book's been the medium is the massage. And um, it's very, very interesting. So what, what does that mean uh, overall? It means regardless of what messages you're trying to create, regardless of what stories you're trying to tell, regardless of any kind of impression, the medium itself is gonna overall overpower any of the message that you're trying to put in it. And understanding that is very important. So though I might try to create a game and have this message in it, the medium of that you know, creation, whatever it is, whether it be a book, a movie, you know, whether it's advertising or a video game will overpower that message. And I think that's very true. And I think it's extremely insightful and it's something that people often don't really think about uh, when they're creating things. I'll leave that with that. I'm just gonna leave that for everyone to think about that for a while. So let's go back to the question, the thesis question of what is the most important factor of video games? And I wanna do a scientific analysis. And that scientific analysis is gonna be a very simple exercise where I wanna break down video games in their most basic components as far as I, I can think of. And if I miss some and someone wants to talk about them later as a component or an area that we didn't talk about, happy to bring it up. But I see sort of five major areas, you know, audio, visual, technology, story, and gameplay as what I would call the most major components of a video game. And let's do a scientific analysis. Let's, and in scientific analysis, you post a hypothesis and if you can disprove it, you're like, okay, that's not correct. Let's move on to the next thing. So what we're gonna ask is, are any of these factors on their own, the most important part of video games? So is audio the most important part? Are visuals, okay? So bear with me here. Let's talk about audio. And uh, I'm a big game player. I'm, I've been playing games all my life and there's been some awesome audio games, you know, Rock Band, uh, Parappa the Rapper. Um, there's so many things that are audio driven uh, that I think really make, uh, really make some awesome games. So the question is, uh, can we find an example where audio just, you know, doesn't, doesn't matter? And so really quickly, the answer is yes. Um, if you look at, if you look at uh, mobile games, uh, oftentimes people, well, not so much these days because of the pandemic, but when you're on a bus, you often don't have the sound on. You don't want to be rude, but you're playing a game with no audio and you're still enjoying it. But there's other things where you're sitting at home and you have multiple streams. You have YouTube or Twitch playing while you're playing a different game. You have the audio turned off. So regardless of how good the audio is, here's an example where despite all that, uh, you can come up with examples where it absolutely doesn't matter. So I think we can say audio can be ruled out as the most important factor of video games. Though it can be very compelling, it's not, not that. So how about visuals? Are visuals the most important factor in video games? And visuals today, you know, you look today and they're just becoming mind blowing. They're getting so realistic. And, um, and a lot of people will say, it's all about the visuals, man. If you want to have a hit game, it's all about the visuals. So can we come up with an example of a game that had terrible visuals and did very, very well? Well, we sure can. <laughs> so if you're going to look at this again, from a scientific perspective or from a scientific analysis per se, um, visuals are not the most important aspect of a video game. There are many other games like this that we can bring up and you'll see some of these categories are overlapping. How about technology? Here's uh, Doom Eternal. I love Doom Eternal, it's really fun. And the technology is awesome. The graphics combined are awesome. The frame rates are awesome. And the way the game plays, just, I, just, I just really have a fun time. It's not, not necessarily for everyone, but I really love it. And back in the day when I first did this talk in 1996, so this is me really trying to create the Aristotle's poetics of video games. I was really analyzing this 
And it made a lot of people angry when I said, you got to be really careful when it comes to technology, there can only be one best technology. Back then, everyone was investing heavily in engines. Are they using this engine or that engine? And uh, so the answer is, is, can you think of a game where technology just really isn't a thing at all? And there are many, like this Dwarf Fortress, but there's many, many games uh, that really the technology is almost a side event where it really comes down to um, the actual uh, investment in the creation of the title. And even though it's extremely low tech, uh, you know, the tech just doesn't matter. And um, I'm a huge Dwarf Fortress fan, by the way, and I'm really looking forward to the version that they're going to release on Steam with some uh, graphics in our ASCII. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, so it's going to be really fun. So anyway, let's rule out technology. Story, let's do story. Story, story, one might think is, uh, you know, it is near and dear to my heart. And uh, please excuse me as I use one of my own games, Eternal Darkness. Um, you know, I really, I really like uh, and I'm proud of some of the things we did with Eternal Darkness. In fact, we, in a holistic way, uh, rolled in gameplay, replaying the levels from a, it's a Lovecraftian game uh, where uh, you're, basically play 12 characters fighting against a, um, a, a someone who's immortal trying to bring in an elder god to our universe and uh, storyline wise uh, you collect you start off by picking an artifact and that defines your storyline well there's three artifacts and every time you play through you get a different story and uh, we combine that with quantum mechanics where we're saying well there's three parallel timelines and if you complete the game with each different artifact three ways you'll get the ultimate ending and i thought i thought that was really cool i i thought it was really fun and uh we won uh, essentially an academy award for the story for this game and um in in the in the video game industry and um i think a lot of people really do think story is the most important factor so can we think of games with no story well that was kind of easy my wife reminds me every day as she plays candy crush the story is not important. And uh, um, uh, there will be a lot of people, particularly these days uh, in the free to play market where it's all driven by competitive uh, arena shooters, story doesn't matter. Um, Wait, and even do though there's- Candy Crush doesn't have a story? I am outraged. Yes, uh, well, there is, <laughs> there, there is a school of thought that every game has a story intrinsically as you tell, you tell what you've done today and that by itself is a story. But yeah, I'd say in general, I don't think it has a story, um, but yes, correct. Um, next, gameplay. This is the one that usually uh, a lot of people will say gameplay is absolutely the most important factor. And uh, when it comes to gameplay, it is the thing that distinguishes the medium of video games from other mediums, what I would call linear mediums like film and television, where you see everything from beginning to end in the order that the author created them in. Uh, this music is the same thing, books are the same thing, but gameplay allows this level of interactivity where you have agency in the experience that you feel. And a lot of people feel that this is just by that definition alone is the most important factor. And I, I could do a real deep dive on some of these things, um, but uh, suffice to say the film industry used to be that way too. And the people who used to uh, make the best films where the people who would cut the film the most, the people who were best at special effects, that later was overcome by story. And uh, so very much like that, I would say gameplay is the same thing. I think it's centrifugal to video games, but can we think of some games where, you know, gameplay isn't the most important factor? And that's games like The Walking Dead. Um, very popular, did very well. There is virtually no gameplay in these. You know, you click things once in a while, but it's really, you know, all about the story and getting through. There's the visual novels. There's all, all kinds of games that uh, people have been questioned to some extent uh, how much, how close to games that they are. But gameplay, by definition of these, by and large, uh, you can say no, gameplay is not the most important factor. So what is the most important factor in video games, you may ask? And I think this is the million dollar question. Um, and if everyone knew the answer to this um, and they had a formula, they'd be very extremely successful. 
So I first talked about this in 1996, and this was me trying to come up with a theory, uh, sort of like Aristotle's poetics, and it's called engagement theory. And what it is, is the combination of all of these factors together, where they become more than the sum of their parts, but they focus on engagement. And uh, this is not just a random word that I use. Um, there is a professor called Dr. Zigzet Mahai that studies this, one of the biggest psychological experiments in the world, and it's the study of flow. And flow is the study of the perfect ecstatic experience where you lose track of time, whether you're an Olympic Olympian and you're losing track of time when you're working out, whether you're an accountant and you're using yourself in your work, if you're making video games and you're programming or you're just playing a game and you know suddenly you think it's uh, 10 o'clock at night and it turns out to be four in the morning where you lose that track of time, that is engagement. And there's a whole theory around this based on psychology. And the idea is to hit that flow factor where you have just the right amount of skill and just the right amount of challenge. And that all comes together by a combination of all of these factors. And um, in making an engaging game is very different than saying making a fun game because it's really difficult to define what fun means. Um, you know, you're enjoying yourself, I guess, but engagement, you're not necessarily enjoying yourself, but you're really in the moment, whether it be a horror, uh, game, whether it be a first person shooter, whether it be a competitive game, whether it be a casual game, whether it's just something that you just love to, you know, lose yourself in that to me is the most important factor. And so now you might say, well, Dennis, what was the point of all this? Um, and I guess the first point is this is the way I think about video games and what does that mean for people who ask me, and I get asked this question all the time, I want to get into the industry. What is important for me to study? What's important to go to school? Well, all of the above. All of the above things that I just told about, that I just talked about are ways to get into the industry. And as a matter of fact, I would say, and I'm going to go through them and we can talk about them and I'm sure people are going to have questions. If you're into audio and you have this awesome idea with audio and you can make the game engaging, then that's a way to get into the industry. If you're an artist, if you're a programmer, if you have this idea, grand idea of a game design, if you want to tell a story in a way that's never been told before, these are all ways to get into the industry. So now we're going to go back to mediums. And I'm going to go back to mediums just for a little while, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the video game industry is always changing. I like to say uh, that we're on the bleeding edge of technology. It's changing all the time. It's changing rapidly. It's changing so rapidly. Things that were true five years ago are not true now. And as a matter of fact, I think we're on the edge of an event horizon because uh, 10 years ago, the industry was dominated by games that were called AAA games, single player games made with huge budgets. And now 86% of all global, global gaming revenue is now free to play. It's a lot of mobile and a lot of online arena shooters like Fortnite, uh, uh, Path of Exile is another one. Um, there are so many free to play games and they're essentially dominating the marketplace. And uh, is you need to consider that this is the new medium. Uh, where you log in, you play with your friends, the multiplayer experience is not only a must, it's a centrifugal part of what you're doing. And you, it's certainly not saying that the old games that I used to make or the old type of games that I used to make aren't good because they are, but just remember you're now putting yourself into this very, very small niche of games, uh, which generally most people think are what dominate the industry. They do not, Call of Duty does not dominate the industry. It's all the games that you generally don't hear about are some of the ones you do hear about, um, but uh, it's all free to play. And this is clouds. Free to play games are clouds. You have to log in. And uh, it really came uh, originally from Korea and then later China. And what a lot of people don't understand is there's a whole cultural thing that really made this happen in uh, that part of Asia in general, their whole perception of copyright 
in ownership is not what it is in the West. And therefore, knowing what that is, where people will just take a premium game and copy it and not thinking anything of it, sell you a computer with all that stuff on it. Um, if that's, that's the case, then how are we going to make money? That's how the free to play market, which changed from a commodity to a service model really was born. And that model is so optimized and is better than a rental system or that you see on Netflix that I think you're seeing with some consoles now. Free to play is the ultimate medium because people can try the game for as long as they want. If they like it, they'll invest in it. And you're really competing with people's time. And if they like it a lot, generally there's a trend that they will spend money on it. And that's what the free to play market is. You have to work really hard. It's a hard market, but that's where, um, that's what it is. So knowing all of these things and what I try to emphasize, this is the way that I know, take advantage of it, capitalize on it. More than anything else, make a demo. If you want to get into the industry, make something for two reasons. The first reason is if you want to get a job at a larger company, uh, anyone who applies at uh, the companies I've been at and the company that I'm currently at, first thing we look at, do they have a demo of any kind? Doesn't matter what field you're from. Did you try to make a game? And if the answer is yes, that is huge because making anything is very hard. It's very easy to start something, but finishing it and making it and getting it out there, even a demo or a prototype, very, very difficult. Um, so that's really huge. The other part is you may make something, find it takes off and you start your own company. Awesome. We, we need as many new creative minds in the video game industry as possible. And uh, so I, I can't emphasize it enough. Make a demo, start a company, go apply to another company. Uh, that is without question the best way to go. So what are the paths? Uh, the most common path that people tell me is, hey, I, I, is my best way to get into the video game industry to become a tester? Because I like playing video games. I can test video games. And uh, certainly that is one of the most common ways to get into the video game industry. And... That is one of the ways I just don't recommend um, only because it's really difficult. It's what I would call a meat grinder approach where you will face, uh, especially if you want to get into a larger company, it's the most fierce competition. Uh, testing is very difficult. Uh, learning games through testing can be done, but getting through the ranks of a tester to a position where you're going to get is very, very difficult. I think you're much better off I don't know, say you, you have some programming skill, doing a demo with programming and getting it done or creating some kind of prototype and trying to get in that way than you would just going through the testing groups. Uh, it is a possible way. It's probably the most common way. Uh, it's something that I never did. I was one of those guys who, you know, got a couple computer science degrees because I didn't think I was qualified with a phys ed degree to make a video game. I wanted to give myself the tools to be able to create something where I felt comfortable. I did. I started it, I created it, and that's the way I recommend for everyone, quite frankly. And it doesn't necessarily mean start your own company, but whatever your skills are, whatever your passion is, and I, I recommend a, a combination of passion and skills, do something with that and then try to get in that way. Uh, testing is very, very difficult. Uh, writing also very difficult way to get in, uh, only because uh, there are very few CEOs who believe in narrative. I'm one of them. And uh, I love narrative and I hire teams of writers. Um, I am definitely in the very small minority of uh, people who make video games who believe in that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I've been on a few panels. Uh, actually, ironically, even with some people from id who are good friends with me still today, where we got into uh, somewhat of a dispute of how important story was. And uh, the id guys were like, story doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I don't agree with that, but uh, you know, they sold a lot of copies of doom and uh you know quake and uh they they uh have their position and it's pretty well backed up by you know their view and their way of making video games uh audio a uh, lot of audio people um trying to get into video games and i would say when it comes to writing and audio really think about what separates video games from the traditional mediums of film and television. And that's where you want to apply your trade to. 
So uh, nonlinear, procedurally generated story, you know, branching storylines, procedurally generated audio, um, you know, things that react with the game. So you start layering things that are pro programmatic. And uh, a lot of the audio stuff that we've done in the past, you know, really takes advantage of that. So um, yeah, so think about it that way if you're thinking of coming in from the audio direction. Gameplay, uh, it's really tough. There's a lot of schools that um, teach basics of gameplay. And I will say this, um, it's disappointing in large. It's really, you really want to get with schools that have some really good academics and people that aren't afraid to push the envelope. But I think by and large, uh, the best academic foundation for gameplay is psychology um, and a ludology where they study the decision-making that goes into creating games. And um, unfortunately, you don't see a lot of that. You see a lot of uh, people following how to make certain games. And uh, a lot of the games that I've made and a lot of things that I've done, uh, and I would encourage people who are thinking about gameplay, try to think of gameplay ideas that no one's ever done before, where there is no basis. And then if, when there is no basis, you can fall upon some kind of foundation where you just have general axioms that work and don't work. If you learn formulaic ways of doing things without that foundation, it's very difficult. So Anyway, uh, gameplay is really hard. Um, what we generally do at Apocalypse is, and where I see a lot of game companies going to get to gameplay, you have to graduate and work at the company from other areas like programming or art. A lot of, uh, as an example, Miyamoto-san, who I worked with and had the pleasure of working with on Eternal Darkness and Metal Gear, along with Kojima-san, but Miyamoto-san was an artist who, after being an artist for many years at Nintendo, was promoted to gameplay where he knew games enough that he started making gameplay. And that's essentially what we're doing in Apocalypse too. So you could be a programmer, you could be an artist. And after a while of getting some pretty good uh, experience behind you, then we'll start bringing you into sort of the gameplay meetings because the stuff is really hard and making games uh, and making them well is very, very difficult. And it's, it is very challenging where you're, uh, you really have to concentrate on it and you really have to have some experience to get it done well. And in my opinion, uh, you know, obviously visuals artists, there's all kinds of great programs for visual arts uh, all over the world. And um, there, that is a very good way of getting into the industry. It's one of the easier ways, I would say, if you're a fantastic artist, you train yourself with all the latest programs, you get, you get a degree, or even if you don't get a degree, you can do some 3D stuff. You can do some concept stuff like you see here on the side. Um, definitely a great way to go. Technology-wise, programming. If you're a programmer, uh, you can definitely get into the video game industry. One of the things to understand about the video game industry, though, of course, is um, there can be a lot of hours, and the pay is probably going to be lower than what you see in other typical technology places. Um, but the fun, the, the trade-off is it's so much fun. It's so it's so engaging. I love it so much. Uh, a lot of people tend to go into the video game industry, even though they get paid less because they just love it. And uh, that's me. That's what I did. Um, you know, could have had jobs. Once I graduate, graduated with my master's in comp sci, I could have gone to a lot of places, but I started my own company instead. Uh, was a bit of a dreamer that way, but I love it. And I, I don't regret a single moment. So if you are going to start your own company, are you going to be creating your own game? Or are you going to be working on something? I have this golden rule that I like to say to people because it's super important. Um, being in the industry for a long time, we all have our successes and we all have our failures and it can become really muddy and it become very difficult to try to decide where you should go. And, and my golden rule is very simple. When you're making entertainment, you never know if you're going to be able to please a single person. You just don't know. So what you should do, in my opinion, is do something you love yourself and then you're guaranteed to please one person. And that love and enthusiasm that you have for what you were creating will come through and others will appreciate it. That is my true belief. And um, through my 30 years of being in the video game industry, I think that that rule in general has provided more success than failure. And um, I recommend it strongly. So 
And I get to show a few things off today because today we revealed uh, with Dead House Sonata some of the first uh, 3D models that we're working on, in-game models. And I get to show off some of the things that I love. So you'll remember at the beginning of this talk, I showed this concept. And one of the things I, I, I really like thinking about big worlds, huge worlds, and this Dead House Sonata, this is Nagastak, the king of the undead, he's a revenant. Revenants are undead beings uh, that come back to life driven by complete hatred for what happened to them before they died. And this particular character has got a sentient hammer. We've got all kinds of storylines and uh, radio plays uh, on our website, you know, before the game launches, it is going to be a narrative game, but this is Nagaztak. And what I love about making videos games is creating these concepts and bringing them to life. So this is, which we just started, which we showed for the first time today, um, an in-game model of Nagaztak from concept to visualization. And I love, I love it for me. Um, I'm, I love the idea of creating these things and bringing them to life. So this is a 3D model. This is what we call an in-game model. It's low polygon uh, and uh, the game, this is what the, you know, obviously it's a next gen game, but this is what the game is gonna look like. And here's a close up. You can see here with the latest technology, uh, things are starting to look pretty good. And we're very, very excited about these things. And uh, we can't wait to see the reaction. They were just released today and hopefully there's some uh, positive response here as well. And uh, another shot in the gas tank. So there's all kinds of details here. Um, it is an action RPG, um, but you can see here, he's got uh, at one point silver armor that's burnt into his skin uh, because he is undead and uh, the undead don't like silver. Um, but uh, anyway, and this is the final shot, I believe. And I just thought I would show it today because it was uh, serendipitous of, of this talk. And uh, so that is uh, at a 10,000 foot level, what I think you need to get into the video game industry. That's, so, that's some amazing artwork. That is, that is badass. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're really, really excited about it. And um, yeah, I just, the whole concept of even playing the undead, you know, fighting the living, I think it's really neat. So you can, so here's a revenant. There's going to be vampires, which you've seen concepts for and through this talk and, um, you know, you know, banshees, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. So anyway, this is our first, this is our first model that uh, this is, you know, anyway, happy about it. Thank you. <laughs> it looks fantastic, dude. That's amazing. Thanks. All right. So, um, I, ha I have questions. Uh, Sean, Ziggy, you guys want to go first? Uh, you go for it, Chris. Okay. So um, in, in the talk, you were, you're, you're talking about how narrative is given short shrift. And, and, uh, and the, so I, I get why the guys from id would say that because Doom is pew pew. And there's 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 no storyline. They 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 literally just came out with the 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 kind of like a quasi storyline. It's just been shooting everything. But the in my opinion, and that's probably the that's probably the thing. It's my opinion. The 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 storylines, the the best games have been games like Mass Effect or or something where you've got these long, epic stories that you get really invested in the characters. So so. When you're when you get into the and, and I'm glad to hear that you have like you know great story writers and on the team and everything. When 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 you talk to people from Candy Crush or it or something like that, is it is it really like a um, is it is it a back and forth? Do do they do they understand the importance of narration or or is it? I mean, you you say that you're the you're you're a, a small voice in the in the in the field. So why is that? Well, I I would. It's very simple. It's 86% um, of global revenues are free to play games and there's virtually no narrative in any free to play game that I can think of. Uh, Path of Exile is a, like a free to play game is a really good example of the best story that no one really listens to. There's, there's definitely story in there, but um, um, the id, Candy Crush, um, they, I would say, just don't respect the value. And they think the effort that goes into storytelling is not uh, economical. It doesn't, the 
uh, amount of effort that you have to put into story and visuals. It gets quite expensive to do cinemas um, where they would say it's just not worth it. You're better off concentrating on these gameplay elements and these gameplay loops and these microtransaction loops that make money for us. And I, I think, you know, certainly there's definitely something to that, but I'm a big believer in my, for my entertainment personally, I love stories. I love details. You know, my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all times, Blade Runner. And those are really good examples of excellent stories or, um, but uh, not everyone feels that way. And I would say, yeah, I'm definitely in how many, how many people in the industry that you're aware of that are known for good stories, probably a handful. Whereas if you were to say how many people are known for multiplayer games or big shoot, there's a whole ton of those. So yeah, it's pretty rare in general. Um, so that's just the way it is. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, the, the ROI answer. I was, I was, I was dreading that. <laughs> it's like, but yeah. it's, it's almost like a lost art. It's like, you know, the, all right. So the, um, the apprenticeship model that, that you were talking about, where, where you have a, a, a worker that's, that's in one side of it, and then they, they, they graduate up, they like, oh, I want to get into the gameplay side of it. D does, does that model work well? Is, is that, is that a, a good foot in the door for the, for the beginner that, that's, that's getting into the industry? Um, you, you said that you know, being a test player is like a really grindy way of, of doing that. So yeah. the... If, if you were if you were starting over again today how would you do it um well i would do it i i guess exactly the way that i described was pick um a, a, a found a, a part of i would get educated in a way that was a solid foundation mm -hmm. and use that solid foundation to apply those skills in the industry and come at it from a sideways position not not get in from a testing approach and build your way up so Testers often become game designers, but it takes like a long time to get out of that testing pool to actually become a designer. It's a really a grind where I would say if you're a, a competent programmer and you really like what you do and you start saying, hey, I really want to get into game design. There's a real bonus to that because when it comes to creating logic for video games and say artificial intelligence, if you have a programming background and you understand how AI generally works, then when you start thinking about how it's going to work, you're going to have that uh, computing uh, framework to build your ideas off of. Whereas if you don't have that and you have no experience, you say, I want to do some game design and you try to make, uh, you know, this AI tree, it's going to be complete spaghetti because you just don't have that foundation of what's going to work. And that's not right. saying you can't do, do it, but I just think by and large, uh, you're just going to get better quality out of the people with the, foundational backgrounds with whatever they are. And it's not even necessarily, to be clear, it's not necessarily educational. Um, it, could be exp it could be experiential. They're all just as good. Um, you know, I certainly recommend, uh, you know, school for some things, but other things are just more practical in other ways of doing it. So there's many ways of doing that. But I think that sort of foundational approach is how you get the best quality. And I, I'm a quality over quantity person. So uh, that might be a bias, but that's my strong recommendation. Awesome, cool. All right, folks, your turns, go ahead. So um, I actually I'll... have a, I have a follow-up question actually to Chris's first question too. So if 86% of the industry revenue is free to play, which I like did not know it was that that much, that's, that's really impressive. I, I'd love to know your thoughts about like it is in, in when in, in the frame of your consider taking that into consideration when you want to enter the, enter the industry. Um, what's your opinion about it? Like I see a lot of in the news recently, especially um, kind of the pushback against like my micro transactions, them get, being classified yeah. as gambling in multiple other countries. How much of that is a risk or a, a factor if you're considering this? Like, do you think like in the next two years, like that the industry will have to change again when no one's allowed oh, to, to micro transact? Oh no. I think that is an excellent observation. And what you're seeing there is not what it appears to be. So when you have people getting upset about DLC and microtransactions, that is occurring because of the premium groups trying to make the transition into the recurring revenue. So what's happening is um, you're getting charged for a premium game that's 90 to $100, say. And then on top of that, they put microtransactions in. 
that gets people really angry. And what's happening is you have the premium games that say are like Call of Duty, where I think this is happening, maybe not Call of Duty, but some premium game that's been big for a while where you pay full price. Um, and people expect when they pay for, for uh, full price, they get everything. That's it. I paid for it. I want it. I don't want to spend any more. Where the free to play model, you don't pay anything. And but the revenue side, as I showed you there, is massive. And so you have these companies who have been making these AAA games for 30 years that are all based off of marketing predictions on how yeah. many, yeah, how many, <laughs> oh, there's many, how many, not just EA, to be fair, there's many. There's like Activision, EA, there's many, many, Take-Two, there's a lot of people who make premium games. And understand the way that that business model works is you look at what previously sold well, you then do marketing predictions where you say, if we spend this much on marketing, we will sell this many copies on launch with advertising. And that's how that model's working. Imagine if that no longer worked or that work that was still okay, but it's getting smaller every year, which it has been. And mm -hmm. then you're seeing games that are completely free made by like 20 to 40 people like Path of Exile out of Australia, where they're making hundreds of millions of dollars a month. And you have everyone at these big companies saying, I want some of that money. How do we do it? Well, what we can do is we'll sell our premium game, but then we'll get in on these microtransactions. So what you're seeing here, in my opinion, is just growing pains for people trying to figure out the model of how they're going to transition from freemium to free to, to, free -to play, where um, it's really angering a lot of people. It's really tough. And um, uh, two years ago, when we started talking about this, 86% of the industry when we started Apocalypse was not free to play. Matter of fact, it was much less. We had the first year we met people when we started trying to partner and talk to people. It was like, here's our ideas. And half of them in the Western market were like, we're not, we don't do free to play. Since that time today, there is no large company. Actually, it's not true. I would say it's about 15 to 20%. There's still a few hang on people who are hanging on saying we don't do free to play but almost everyone now is doing free to play. And that's why you hear so many people going into mobile because a significant part of that is mobile. So mobile is making huge money. And um, so I think those are great questions. And rather, rather than being gambling, what's happening is with gambling is they're trying to figure ways to get recurring revenue from people that buy and buy and buy. And unfortunately they're getting way too close to the casinos. And a lot of governments are stepping in and go, wait a minute, this person just spent $20,000 on this. Um, but so I think that's what you're seeing there. That's my opinion of it. So um, again, I think that reinforces why free to play is the way to go. And these companies are trying to figure out how to transition that have a legacy and marketing departments of that's the only way they know how to work actually. So, and that's why you have most Asian are, are yeah, most people from the East whether it be uh, China, you know, Korea, um, those companies are much better at making free-to-play games and Tencent just dominates the market and are very aggressive in that space compared to the Western companies. So, yeah. Cool, okay, so we, um, we have another uh, question from the audience. Sean, do you wanna read this one out? Yeah, sure. All right, so Adam, Rostowitz, I think I pronounced that right, said, one thing I've often heard justifying the use of microtransaction and fully priced games is that the cost of developing games has drastically increased over the years. Do you think that's true? From the outside, I think we, with new technology, game dev would have gotten, would have gotten uh, easier. And uh, So um, what's the best way to answer this? So I think the cost of video games for the AAA space has gone up. I think that's a true fact. I don't think that that can necessarily be tied to why you have to create a premium game and then add microtransactions. I think the end of the, I think it's, so I think it's misleading to say that's why. I think at the end of the day, people just wanna make as much money as they can. And they're trying to figure out a way to do that transition. Uh, definitely games are becoming more expensive. And at the same time, 
uh, we can do a lot. We're becoming more productive. So we're both, they're both becoming more expensive and more, and we're becoming more productive at the same time. So the, um, the quality of things is going way, 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 way up. And the quality of the characters that I just showed here are the best quality characters I've ever made and um, in, in a game. And we're super excited about it. But at the same time, um, I, I think, I think though true, it's not a solid justification for microtransaction and premium games. I, I just not a believer in that. I just don't think that's, um, I don't think that's why it's happening. Do you mean to say that the answer I want to wring every last red cent out of those six-year-olds playing Call of Duty is not a good answer? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, certainly uh, call anyone out or any particular company. But oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, no, I'll, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I, but I, yeah, I think that's a real problem. The problem is, it's some parts are quite frankly, um, you know, everyone wants to make as most money as they can. But the other part is they're literally experimenting. They're trying to figure out how to do it. And they, the, 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 because the industry is changing so much, they really don't know. And a lot of these things, though they may seem maniacal, um, often are just really not smart decisions and not knowing your audience. And uh, so um, I think it's a combination of both. And, you know, so... I think that, uh, I think, yeah, the answer is that that is true, but not a good rationalization for putting microtransactions in a premium game. So that's, uh, that's how I feel about that anyway. So I have a, oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Sean, go ahead. I have a question circling back. I, I really enjoyed the, the engagement theory equation there because it's, it's true. So like when I, when I play games, and I'll circle back to a question I, swear when i play games you know i've played games that range from the mobile games that are really fun i can pick it up do it in a few minutes and be done to games where it's like the caliber of the writing and, and the story and the audio it, it just it's it like it blows my mind how people mm -hmm. have come up with these worlds right yeah yeah so you know, I guess from the writing, from a writing perspective, if somebody was looking to get into the gaming industry, do you think that, I was just trying to think about it here while, you, while we were talking about the microtransactions and free-to-play games, but do you think it's, it's, would it be more lucrative for writers or audio people to get into a free-to-play game market because the games don't necessarily like eventually they can have an ending, but for the most part, it's like an open, it's an open system that's continually evolving. Whereas if you make one of these big games, it's like, I have to make a beginning, middle and end to the story because I have to ship it, right? Yeah, you're, uh, you're preaching to the choir with that one. That's exactly why we started Apocalypse. And so, um, so first of all, why I brought that up, because that's a pretty old theory of mine. I've been talking about it for a while, but if anyone who's listening to this is engaged by that topic and they really want to know the answer to that and they start thinking about it and you should be in video games, that's the Turing test. You know, if that you find engaging, then that is a really good test of should I be doing this? Because these are the things uh, that you have to think about. And when you look at the free to play market, yeah, by and large, there's people do think that free to play and narrative driven games are an oxymoron. And then you've got all these microtransaction issues with premium games that people really, really get angry about where say, oh, here's the first third of the story. And if you pay another bit, you'll get the second third. And then finally you get the full story. That makes people really angry. And, um, but with the free to play space, especially if you have a persistent universe and you look at something that is procedurally story driven, like say Dwarf Fortress, imagine combining that with narrative and different narrative uh, ideas then you're starting to create something, um, as I talked about, you know, uh, the other time, and I, I would suggest anyone check out from the, you know, the other talk that we just did from zero to AWS hero, where I talk about how cloud technology has changed the way I think about telling stories and allows for a community procedurally driven persistent storyline being told, as opposed to the traditional Aristotle's theory of poetics, three act narrative that you get in a triple A story with a you know beginning, middle and an end with the hero's journey and all that stuff. So I think the potential is awesome. And I think uh, 
So again, my background, uh, my background's in computing, I guess a little bit in phys ed, but uh, I'm known for telling stories and maybe that led me to this way. So if you're so inclined to think about stories and I know your background is also, you know, computing, then you have a serious advantage and that would be like, yeah, man, go for it. Because that's where that's, I'm in, I'm in on that theory. And I think there's a lot of possibilities there. And the, the numbers speak for themselves. 86% uh, uh, means you're in the larger category of uh, making money. So if you can do it, um, I, I, I am in, and I would love to always talk about what you're doing. I'll tell you what we're doing, love to exchange information. And I would love to see that being uh, a successful model because moving forward, the internet has commoditized all linear media. Um, you know, certainly where there's no copyright laws, um, that's why piracy is really bad. Um, and I, I'd like to, I'd like to discuss, you know, the following analogy, if you go into a movie theater and someone brings in a camera and you're watching Star Wars um, and you record Star Wars, it might not be the same experience, but you can record the whole thing. And, you know, that's piracy. It's bad. They'll be very upset because they'll lose sales when that gets out on the internet. And the value of that movie gets commoditized to zero. If you do the same thing, you put a video camera over someone's shoulder as they're playing a free to play game. It's not the same experience. You can't capture that. And that's why free to play is so different in cloud based. So if you do that with a video game and you actually copy the software and you make a copy, then that is the same. But if you're up in the cloud where you have to log in and you have a persistent universe, you now have something that cannot be commoditized by the cloud in the internet infrastructure, which let's face it, uh, is going to be everywhere soon. It's already everywhere and it's growing exponentially. So if that's going to be the case and you know, writing is a linear medium, how do we create nonlinear storytelling? If you love stories, that is the only future that's not going to be commoditized. So that's why I strongly recommend it. That's why I'm doing it. And I know it's a bit theoretical, but that's, you know, how I feel about that stuff. Well, you're definitely putting your money where your mouth is. So you, you yes. clearly feel strongly enough about that. I absolutely do. And I, you know, and I uh, would encourage others to do it too. It's a, uh, you know, but you know, I just love it. So. I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, one, one last question. Do, do you ever do you ever see the big AAA game houses going to free to play? Do you ever see Call of Duty being a free to play model where where they where they have microtransactions, not not selling it for 60 bucks and then having microtransactions, but just giving the game away for free and then and then and then adding 495 for an extra set of bullets. It is absolutely inevitable. They, yeah, there is no choice. It will happen. It's only, and it's a matter of uh, evolve or die because um, when you have games that are making uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a month mm -hmm. um, for lifespans of um, years, 10 to 20 years mm -hmm. um, versus a game of a Call of Duty that you make every year. And don't get me wrong, they sell millions of copies and they make a lot of money, but you have what's called like a hump and then you have the tail and then you have to start making another one. Uh, the other model is far superior. It makes much more money um, and is recurring revenue versus a commodity uh, that you, know, you have to constantly create from the ground up. And uh, yeah, it's just far inferior in almost every way, so. Fascinating. Cool. Well, um, in, in, for those of you listening at home, uh, we are actually going to be doing the AWS or the zero to AWS hero talk on V Brown bag next week. And I highly encourage everybody that watched this and enjoyed it to watch that because Dennis, uh, t goes through what, what apocalypse studio went through during the pandemic and, and some of the revelations of how, um, all of these things came to light for him and, and the process of where his, where his gaming studio is going. So uh, Dennis, th from all of us, thank you very much. This was fantastic. Thank you, really appreciate the time. All right, folks, um, thanks for, once again for listening and we'll see you again next week.